baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Amen. I thank God for all of you that are here this morning. Amen. And I pray that some way the Spirit of the Lord would talk to us. I'm not here to try to stir you today. Because I've been to a lot of conferences. And I've heard a lot of messages that have stirred me. But it didn't change me. And we can get stirred and, and not be changed. But I've asked God to some way to allow the power of the Word of God, not to just stir us, but some way that it can change us. That when we walk out of this conference, hallelujah, that we'll be able to look back and say that was the moment, that was a conference, hallelujah, that God did something in me, amen, that I'll never be the same, hallelujah. Now, they've got me in the slot of, of the Word. Amen. And I don't know if I'm going to teach or preach. Probably going to do a little preaching. Maybe a little bit of both. If you have your Bibles, I want to get right into the Word of the Lord. Now, I don't have a watch, so you'll have to kind of pull my coattail. Amen. Here's a clock up here. That's good. I found, learned a long time ago that a good sermon is one when you get through before the, pre- before the people do. So I'll try to get through this morning before you do. Amen. And if we can do that, then maybe we can look back and say, hey, that was a good sermon or a good message. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want to turn your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. I'd like to read from there. Then I'd like to read one verse of Scripture found in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 36. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 5, and also Acts chapter 2 and verse number 36. Amen. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And also in Acts chapter 2, in verse number 36, Paul, or Apostle Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost, and in the middle of his message, he's preaching to a bunch of Jews. And then he declares unto them, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we love you today and thank you for your word. For we know that without you we cannot do anything. I would pray that some way the Holy Ghost would settle down upon us. Allow the Word of God to do the work today. For we know that it's not by might nor yet by power, but it is by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And we're ever going to give you honor and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. You may be seated. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, from the American Standard Version, it says, For the Word of God is living. And active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is the only thing in the world that can divide the soul and the spirit. The writer of Hebrews, he speaks about an instrument that has the ability to cut both ways. And every illustration in the Bible, it suggests energy and power. It is light. It is a hammer. 
It is seed, and it has the ability to penetrate darkness, and it has the ability to break all opposition. It melts, it consumes, it is incorruptible. It lifts, it sustains, it pushes, it conquers. No wonder hell hates the Bible, the word of the Lord. No blade can equal it. It's willing to enter into any arena. It has survived every attack. It is stronger today than in my grandfather's day. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm here to tell you it will take on all challengers. For there is life in the Word. It has the ability to pierce indifferent. It awakes the slumbering. Hallelujah. He provides instant, it provides instant recall. It moves immediately to the quick. Hallelujah. And it lays open. Amen. Paul the preacher, he knew about the authority of the Word of God and instructing a young preacher. He just said, preach the Word. Just preach the Word. If you'll preach the Word of God. Hallelujah. It's powerful. Hallelujah. He'll get down into the very resources of your heart. He'll get right down to where you're living. That is the power and the authority of the Word of the Lord. I want you to know the Word of God. It has the ability. It will eliminate any argument. Satan vacates when he is faced with the Word of the Lord. Hallelujah. No wonder Jesus said, Hallelujah, when he's tempted in the wilderness, for he simply declared, for it is written. It is written. It is written. I'm thankful today for the power and the authority of the Word of the Lord. But we're not here to preach of ourselves, but we're here to some way preach to you what thus saith the Word of the Lord. And I pray that that Word will get right down to where you're living. Hallelujah. And not just stir you, but some way that you will be changed by the power and the authority of that Word. Hallelujah. I want you to know that a man does not argue with his boss. It is true. It is the true beat of his own life. Hallelujah. He does not ask it to be investigated. I cannot deny the sun. The sunshine is proof. The word is such evidence. For it is testimony unshaken by cross examination. The Bible with the speed of light shows the man his inner self unto him. Hallelujah. I want you to know that it's deadly because it's accurate. Hallelujah. You know what? It's not important what you think about me today. It's not important what others see. Because so many times, all you ever see is the facade. We put on different faces. But God has the ability to get down to where we're living. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Word of the Lord. The scriptures that I've read to you today talks about, hallelujah, that God hath made him both Lord and Christ. I've come to preach to you today simply the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The word Savior occurs 24 times in the New Testament, but the word Lord occurs 433 times. If I were to ask this congregation today, do you believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ? No doubt I would get an easy answer of yes, I believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But if I were to ask each individual in this congregation today, is He Lord of all that you are? Is He Lord of all that you have? I'm afraid that we might get a little bit different answer. For anybody can sing, bring forth the royal diadem and crown Him Lord of all. But it's another story. Hallelujah. As you walk through life to some way find that place to where He is Lord of everything that you are. Hallelujah. This sermon come out, this message come out of a 
deep, dark time in the life of our church. In about three months' time, we baptized 68 and had 65 receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was happening so fast. And I ended up having 50 in a new life class. And I've watched them as they come in. They enjoyed our worship. They liked to shout. They liked to run the aisles. They liked our singing. They liked our excitement. Hallelujah. But in the midst of that, some of those only made it about three months. Some made it six months. Some even made it a year. And some made a year and a half. And after it was all over, hallelujah, out of that 68, we ended up keeping about 16 or 17 people. That caused our church to go into an emotional shock to have that many babies come in and then seemingly go out the door. And I was praying, God, help us. What in the world is going on? Why is it that they're not staying? Amen. And we kept, if you'll figure that up, that's about 25%. Amen. The Bible teaches us, hallelujah, that as the seed of the Word of God is sown, only about 25% of that is really going to come up and bear fruit. But as I was studying and looking at that, the Lord gave me this message that I preached to my church to help them to understand why some just made it three months, why some just made it six months, or some just made it a year or a year and a half. Hallelujah. They came to know Him as Savior of their life, but they never come to know Him as the Lord of everything. They come to really, never really come to know Him and allow Him to become the Lord of their life. Hallelujah. Somebody has stated that truth often considered are so true that they lose the power of truth and lie bedridden in the dormitory of the soul. I will declare unto you today that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is one of those truths. The Lordship of Christ was the initial confession of the church. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt Thou believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. But you need to understand that when a Jewish convert in the early church, when he said Jesus is Lord, what he really meant was that Jesus was God. But when a Gentile believer, hallelujah, when they said that Jesus is Lord, he meant that Caesar was no longer his God. Polycarp, he went to his death affirming the Lordship of Christ above the claims of Caesar. I want you to know as you begin to study the New Testament, you'll find that it's never Christ and because one never needs to add anything to Jesus. For He has been declared the Alpha and Omega. Amen. The first and the last. That which was, which is, and is to come. He has been declared as a stone of Israel. He is the rock of my salvation. He is a mighty fortress. David said, He is my shepherd. He is the restorer. He is a strong and the mighty Jehovah. He is Jehovah mighty in battle. Hallelujah. I want you to know that He is the King of glory. A strong tower. He's wisdom. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. He's altogether lovely. He's been called a sanctuary. Wonderful. Counselor. Isaiah called Him the mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. The mighty God. Hallelujah. He is. Amen. The light of Israel. He is the the root of Jesse. (laughs) Hallelujah. I don't know what it is you need today, but I want you to know that if you're going through a storm, He is a refuge from the storm. If you need something that's unmovable today, I want you to know He's been declared as the rock of the ages. He is a sure foundation. He's the trial stone. He is the Lord Jehovah, the everlasting God, the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah. He's a man of sorrows, the Redeemer. Hallelujah. He is our potter. He is the bomb of Gilead. And His name is Jesus. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. (laughs) 
Oh, I feel him in this place today. Hallelujah. He's walking up and down these aisles. Amen. Whatever it is you need. Hallelujah. All you need is you can just get Jesus. He's been called the great physician. The hope of Israel. Ancient of days. The hope of his people. The ruler. The branch. The son of Abraham. He's been called Emmanuel. God with us. A governor. A friend of sinners. The Christ. The prophet of Nazareth. Master. The bridegroom. The carpenter. The son of Mary. The son of man. He's a ransom. He's the king of the Jews. The son of the highest. He is the only begotten of the Father. The Lamb of God. The Son of God. Rabbi, the King of Israel, Messiah, the bread of life, and the light of the world. He is the great one. He's the great I am. He is the good shepherd. What is it that you need today? I'm here to tell you, if you can get Jesus in your life, if you can make him Lord of your life, you don't need to add anything else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't need another program. We got plenty of programs. Hallelujah. The Bible says that it was a man sent from God. Hallelujah. Not a program. But if you can just have a man. Hallelujah. That's sent from God. Hallelujah. I don't care where you go. You can walk into where a town where there is no church. You can walk into where the truth is not being preached. But a man sent from God, hallelujah, can walk into there and can begin to take the word of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, it'll come against false doctrine. Amen. I'm here to tell you, it'll break down barriers. That's the power of the word of God. Hallelujah. I want you to know that the Bible declares that it's Christ or the world. Christ or Belial. Christ or the devil. Is Christ or Egypt. Is Christ or Caesar. Early Christianity demanded a clean break with the world. The flesh and the devil. For he said, come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Paul declared that I die daily, bringing my flesh in the subjection to the spirit. And the Bible declares, neither give place to the devil. But you'll find in studying church history that that lasted until Constantine made Christianity fashionable and popular. Pagans flocked into the church lightheartedly, bringing their idols and their sins with them. And you'll find that the church lowered her standards to accommodate the influx of those that came into the church. I want you to know today, although Caesar is dead, too many church people, members are trying to serve two lords. They're trying to serve Caesar and Christ. They're trying to serve God and mammon. Hallelujah. Churches are filled with people living double lives, fearing the Lord, but yet serving their own gods, drawing nigh unto God with their mouths and honoring Him with their lips while their hearts are far from Him, calling Him Lord, Lord, while they do not what He says to do. Hallelujah. We're not only to worship the Lord on Sunday, but we are to serve Him all week long. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is the authentic confession of the Christian. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 3, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and 
that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Calling Jesus Lord is the work of the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you, being born again, for one thing that you'll find about the old Adam, the old Adam never bows to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's the reason you got to repent. you got to die out to self. you got to die out to sin. That's the reason you got to fall at an altar. Hallelujah. I want to get dead. Hallelujah. I want to get dead. But so many times that flesh tries to rise up. And we got to take it back to an altar. You can't live. Hallelujah. You can't live. My flesh has to die. I've got to crucify this flesh. I've got to bring it into subjection to the Spirit. Because the Spirit may want me to do some things that I might not want to do. The Spirit might want me to do some things that I might not like. But I'm my flesh with desire to do other things. But I'm not going to listen to the dictates of my flesh. But I want to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would have to say unto me. I want to yield myself totally unto that Spirit. I wonder what would happen if the church would ever get to the place to where it hated the things that God hates. There is a Christian virtue of hate. Hallelujah. It seems that nowadays that we seem to have created an artificial distinction between trusting Him as our Savior and confessing Him as our Lord. Almost, it's almost like people have made two experiences out of it when it is really just one. Hallelujah. So you have people who pray through. They receive the Holy Ghost. They become a part of the church in order to miss hell and reach heaven, who seem not at all concerned about making Him Lord of their lives. Salvation, I want you to know, is not a cafeteria line where we can take the Saviorhood of Christ and pass up on His Lordship. Take what we want and leave the rest. We can't get saved on the installment plan, hallelujah, with our fingers crossed and in a reference. Reservation, hallelujah, as though one could take Christ on approval. No, friend, to be sure, we may, one may not understand all that is involved at conversion, but no man can knowingly and willfully take Christ as Savior and reject Him as Lord and be saved. We find too many people, hallelujah, I want you to know the only choice you had was when you walked into an apostolic church bound by the chains of sin. The only choice you had when you walked in, miserable, you didn't know where to turn. Everything was going wrong in your life. And you sat in a Pentecostal church, hallelujah, hearing the message preach and conviction grip your heart. And somewhere in the midst of that, you had a choice to make. Hallelujah. Do I want to come to know Him as Savior of my life or not? But I want you to know, once you knelt at an altar, once you repented, once you got baptized in Jesus' name, once you got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. From that point on, you didn't have a choice in the matter. Hallelujah. You had to decide whether you wanted to come to know Him as Savior or not. But after you have made the decision that I want Him to take my sins away. I want Him to open up the prison house door for me. I want to walk free. Hallelujah. Free from the chains of sin. Once you've made that decision and you have come to know Him as Savior of your life, it's not too long in the midst of your running aisles. I'm here to tell you, new converts, I I love new converts. They run in the aisles and don't even know why they're running. We had a new convert. She got the Holy Ghost. She come right out of the drug scene. Went to a ladies' meeting. And uh, they began to sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Hallelujah. And... uh, she hadn't been in church long enough to know we don't run aisles on Amazing Grace. Right. 
Hallelujah. But as they begin to sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Her dad's a deacon in a Baptist church. But oh, as they begin to sing it, something begin to swell up within her. Hallelujah. She realized once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. She got out in the aisle. She began to run around. Hallelujah. Pentecostal people that has been in church all their life. Hallelujah. Just kind of stood and looked and saw what was going on. But I'm here to tell you. Hallelujah. God loves us. He cares about us. I'm glad that He reached into my life at 11 years old. Hallelujah. Oh, once we receive Him, our option ends. We're no longer our own. The Bible says that we're bought with a price. Hallelujah. That He hath purchased us with His own blood. We belong to Him. He has the first word and the last. He demands absolute loyalty beyond that of any earthly dictator. But He has the right to do it. I said He's got a right to do it. Because love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. What right? How foolish it is to say nobody is going to tell me what to do. How foolish to say nobody is going to tell me how much to give. What right does he have to tell me what to do? I'll tell you what, he's got every right in the world. Because after you come to know him as Savior, it's not too long in your walk with God that the Word of God begins to penetrate you. And you begin to hear the preaching of the Word. And you say, wait a minute, I cannot just come to know him as Savior. Now, I've got to give 10% unto the Lord. Now, he's going to tell me how I'm so supposed to walk. Now he's going to declare unto me how I'm supposed to talk. Now he's going to tell me how I'm supposed to live. But so many people, hallelujah, they like the miracles. They like the blessings. Hallelujah. When the Philistines took the ark of God, there were three things that was in it. You had Aaron's rod that budded. You had that Moses law, the Ten Commandments, and you had uh, the manna. But when it came back to the Israelites, after it had been in the hands of the Philistines, it came back with only one thing in it, and that was the law of God. Hallelujah. Aaron's rod that budded represented the miracles of God. The manna represented the blessings of God. When it come back, hallelujah, they wanted the miracles of God. They wanted the blessings of God. But they did not want the thou shalt not of God. Hallelujah. That's what has happened with a charismatic world. They want the miracles and they want the blessing. But they don't want anybody telling them how they're supposed to live. They don't want anybody telling them how they're supposed to submit. Hallelujah. And what is happening when, when, when Pentecostals, those that know the truth of the Word of God, when they give into that compromising spirit. Hallelujah. They say, we're just going to go just a little ways. Hallelujah. And they begin to lower their standards. It's not too long that somewhere in the midst of it, they're going to lose the truth of the Word of God. Their doctrine is going to go out. I'm here to tell you the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. I want to hear what it is that He has to tell me. I want to please Him. I'm not interested in pleasing my flesh. I'm not interested in bringing satisfaction satisfaction to this flesh, but some way God, whatever it is that you want me to do, however it is you want me to live, my flesh may not like it, but I'm going to submit to my Lord and my Master. Hallelujah. For I'm under new management. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I'm not what I used to be. I want you to know I've been changed by the power of God. But He's still working on me. I'd like to tell you that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is a one-time experience. But it's not, friend. It is a journey. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, it is. Hallelujah. It is that relationship. That's what it's all about. Hallelujah. I was preaching the other night, and I preached from this point that it's more important to have a relationship than it is to have an answer to all of your questions. Hallelujah. It's more important that I walk with Him. Oh, God. Oh, God. I don't need a pretty sermon. Hallelujah. But I need you. I want to submit to what it is that you want in my life. Because, you see, there's some things in this 35 years that I would have never chosen. That I would have never said, let me walk through that. Let me go in that manner. Hallelujah. Oh, we're serving an awesome God. The very purpose... Of Him filling us with the Holy Ghost and us being baptized in Jesus' name was not so that we could just miss hell and go to heaven. But what God was trying to do is restore man back in full fellowship and relation to Him. Hallelujah. He's endeavoring to conform us into His image. That's the reason that I needed to be born again. Because this old Adam, it wants its way. This old Adam, it wants to do things this way. No wonder Paul a very educated man. There's other things he could have done in life that would not have brought him the hardship. Hallelujah. That came his way. Jesus gave one of the worst sale pitches that you'll ever hear anywhere. After he had resurrected and, and we find the disciples, they're, they're coming in on their boats, and they see Jesus. He's having a little fish fry. And he's having that little fish fry. Hallelujah. Peter jumps out of the boat. After they get through eating, Jesus gets Peter, and they take a little walk. And he says, uh, Lovest thou me? Oh, Lord, you, you know I love you. Feed my lamb. Lovest thou me? Lord, you know, I just answered that. You know I love you. Feed my lamb. Three times. And then when he got through, the worst sales pitch that you'll ever find, as he began to tell Peter, said, when you were young, you went where thou wouldest. But there's coming a day that they're going to lead you around. There's coming a day, and he begins to foretell him, of his death and some of the things that are going to happen in his life. And when he gets through, then he tells him, follow me. Jesus, if I was going to get the Apostle Peter to follow me, what I would have done is say, if you'll follow me, you're going to be the preacher at Pentecost. You're going to be a great preacher. You're going to be an awesome man of God. I mean great things. You're going to see awesome miracles. You're going to be able to walk in your shadow. And people just getting in your shadow is going to be healed. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to give a good sales pitch, I mean, you tell all the benefits that there's going to be in following after Him. But Jesus didn't do that. Hallelujah. You know what, Jesus, here he is, he's getting ready to go away. And uh, 
He spent three to three and a half years. And what he did, he was building a relationship with his disciples. No wonder Paul could write, Charity never faileth. Love never fails. And then a few verses down, he says, Now we see through a glass darkly. Now we're looking through a dirty window pane. We can't see things too clearly. We don't understand why this is happening or why that is happening. Hallelujah. God don't produce preachers with a cookie cutter, but whom He calls, He qualifies. Hallelujah. Who in their right mind would want to be a preacher? Hallelujah. Who in their right mind would want to be a preacher in this last days? But when the call of God comes, God is going to put you in pressure situations. And it's in those pressure situations, hallelujah, that you're going to have to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. Not what I want, God, but what is it that you want? What is it that you want out of me? Hallelujah. For you've got to be totally submitted unto Him. I never wanted a pastor in a small town. That would not have been something that I would have chosen. My first church was in a large city. And it was where I went to school. I was only 22 years old. I didn't know nothing about pastoring. But God put me in a pressure cooker. And I learned some things about people. And I learned some things about me. And I learned some things about God. I left there. I thought God sent me there to build a church. I left there feeling like a failure. I left there wondering... One thing, I never want to pastor again. I was even wondering whether I was really even called to preach. And I went from that pressure cooker into another one. It was eight years before I ever pastored again. And one day, about two years ago, in prayer, in my church, I was praying. And God spoke to me and said, you remember when I sent you to Columbus, Georgia? I said, yes, God, I won't ever forget that experience the longest day I live. He said, I just wanted you to know I did not send you there to build a church, but I sent you there that I might build a man. I don't know where it is that God may have you, but God's working on you. He's putting some things in you. I fought a spirit of suicide. I went through a time where I would gather in the church that I was a sister pastor. And Satan came unto me as I would pray. And I fought a spirit of suicide. He would tell me ways that I could take my own life. And I struggled with that spirit. It was years later. I went back to that church. They were in revival. I got there early. I went into the auditorium where I used to pray. And I was praying, seeking after the Lord. And I got back to that place where the devil used to torment my mind and fight me. And the Lord spoke a scripture to me. I did not know what it said. I went and got my Bible and read in Job 23 and verse 6. Job asked the question of his friends. He asked the question, will he plead against me with his great power? But then he, he answered his own question. He says, no, but he would put strength in me. And the Lord spoke to me when you were here and Satan was coming against you and fighting you with that spirit. I was putting strength in you. I feel Him in this place today. I feel the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. If all you know Him in your life as just your Savior, you're missing the boat. (laughs) 
when we become believers, we are to go ahead and become disciples. You see, the believer comes to Christ. Then as a disciple, he comes after him. Some take a stand for the Lord and keep standing. And some folks just take a step, but not a walk. The birth of a child is an important event, but it takes 20 years after that to make a man or woman of that child. Evangelism is thrilling business, but it's only the beginning because the believer must be developed as a disciple and a witness. Salvation is free. The gift of God is eternal life. It's not cheap, but it is free. For it cost His shed blood at Calvary. Hallelujah. I want you to know that Jesus, when we become believers, amen, and then we are to become disciples, to become a disciple. It don't cost you anything to become a, a believer. Hallelujah. It's free. But oh, I'm here to tell you that to become a disciple, it will cost you everything you are. It will cost you everything you have. And you'll find in the Word of God that Jesus lost some of His very best prospects on that very point in Luke the ninth chapter. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And then he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That looked like that would have been an honest request. And then another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go then bid farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Oh, yes, friend, he lost some of his best prospect on that, hallelujah, of it costing you everything you are. It appears, hallelujah, he lost the rich young ruler. What a prospect he was. He had manners because he came kneeling. He had morals for he kept the commandments. He had money for he would not let it go. He was a good catch, but the Lord did not catch him. When the sick and the sinful came to Jesus, he dealt with them in tenderness. But to the prospective followers, he threw out a very stern challenge unto them. Let the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I want you to know in Luke the 14th chapter, he gave three cannot of discipleship. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 14. Beginning with verse number 25. And there went great multitude with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What are you talking about? Oh, and then we read, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, you cannot be his disciple. It's already been declared. There is a cross to bear. He went on to say, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my 
disciple. When he lost the rich young ruler, hallelujah, Jesus is in the middle of teaching. And then all the rich young ruler, he interrupts him. And he wanted to know what he had to do with the inter- eternal life. Jesus said, you got to keep the commandments. Well, I've kept them. But then Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful. He left church too early. Because if you'll read, Jesus picked right up with his teaching. And in just a little while, he says, no man. Hallelujah. Has give up mother, father, sister, brother. You're not going to give up anything that I will not repay you 100 fold. Hallelujah. That rich young ruler, he left church just a little early. If he'd have hung around to Jesus, got through teaching, he'd have found out. Hallelujah. You may give up everything that you have. Hallelujah. But he is going to replace it and he's going to put it back in you. You're not going to give up anything. Hallelujah. That he's not going to bless you for it. That he's not going to touch you. Hallelujah. He'll repay you a hundredfold. Hallelujah. I want you to know Jesus was after disciples. He wasn't just looking for folks to join His religious club. You know what? Americans are great joiners. You can give them a red button and a t-shirt and they'll join almost anything. Hallelujah. But Jesus is not looking for folks just to join His church. He's not looking for people just to be involved with Him, but He's looking for people that would become totally committed unto Him. Hallelujah. Here people sitting on pews knowing God is Savior. They come in, God delivered them from alcohol. He delivered them from drugs. He put their marriages back together. And then the preaching of the Word goes forth in a service. Hallelujah. God is trying to get them to a deeper dedication and a consecration and a relationship with Him. And yet people will say, no, I'm not giving that up. No, preacher, you're meddling just a little bit. No, you're not going to tell me what to do. Kids, you don't have to listen to that preacher. You don't have to listen to what it is that he's having to say. All he's trying to do is take the Word of God and get you from Saviorhood under the Lordship. All he's trying to do to get you from that place of just knowing Him as your Savior to begin to walk the journey of coming to know Him as Lord of everything that I am. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, in the secret resources of your heart, there's places you haven't let him walk. In the very core of your soul, I know you give him a part of yourself, but he's not wanting just a part of you. If you're not willing to forsake all, put it in His hands. He said, you can't be my disciple. Many, no doubt, would have taken the rich young ruler into church immediately. Probably would have given him a position. But Jesus wanted him to mean business. The New Testament teaches not only faith in Christ, but following Christ. Come unto me. That invites the believer. But learn of me. That makes the disciple. You see, the Word of God knows nothing of that strange variety of Christian that is willing to take Him as Christ are willing to take Christ as His Savior, but unwilling to confess Him as His Lord. He's not only the Savior of the soul, but He is the Lord of the life. Our musicians will come. We're told that one day, every knee is going to bow. 
And every tongue shall confess that He is Lord. You see, when you confess Him as your Lord, take everything that I am. I give it unto you. I hold nothing back in reserve. I submit it into your hands and to your trust. I submit my life, my ministry, my family, my eternity uh, totally unto you, God. You become under new management. Oh, yes. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If eventually, why not now? Eventually every tongue shall confess Jesus is Lord in heaven, on earth, under the earth. If eventually, why not now? Is He your Lord? Is He Lord of your thoughts? Is He Lord of your tongue? Is He Lord of your temper? Is He Lord of your spare time? Is He Lord of your life plans? Is He Lord of your pocketbook? Is He Lord of your church life? Is He Lord of your recreation? Is He Lord of what you listen to? Is He Lord of what you look at? His Lordship covers everything, but it is not bondage, it's freedom. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We are free to do everything that is good and right in our relationship with God. We're free to do whatever is good and right in relationship to ourselves. And we're free to do everything that is good and right in our relationship to others. So I beseech you today, make Him Lord of your life now. Jesus, oh, I'm stirred. You shook me up a little bit today. I want to just be stirred. Change me. Make me what I want to be. Let me submit my life plan into your hands. I know you're my Lord and Master. I never wanted a pastor in a small town. But you sent me there. I'm there in your will. <laughs> How about it? Would you allow him to be the Lord of everything that you are?
Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful. What we do in life echoes in eternity. What we do in life. Echoes, echoes, echoes in eternity.